how could a full-time Auburn PD officer commit all the crimes he was doing across all Northern California? I was like, there's just no way, you know, that he wouldn't have the time. Howard Doss. What's happening, Sean? Man, uh... I'm excited uh, and yet sad. It's what they call that, what they call bittersweet, I believe, about this episode. Um, And our guest doesn't even know this yet. So uh, we'll introduce him here in a moment. But we have been at this cocktails and cocktails thing for a year plus. Yeah. And uh, it was something that started on a car ride that we had during the COVID days when you were doing nursing up in the New York City area uh, at the heyday of COVID. And when you so kindly flew up and I, rode back with me. I did. I flew up, rode back with you. So we had a lot of time together, a lot of bullshit in the car, and um, basically became professional bootleggers. We picked up a lot of bourbon along the we, way in Kentucky. We, allegedly. Back. Allegedly. Any, any ATF people want allegedly. to chase a ex-cop with liquor rather than a gun toter, that's fine. Yeah. But um, so uh, we came up with the idea of cocktails and cocktails, got on board with the Long Crime Network. And uh, this is our very last episode that we're doing. Um, And reason being that we're doing it, I'll let you give your spiel for it. Well, you know, you started working and I've started working. And unfortunately, we work on different ends of the United States. I'm going to be in Oregon. You are. And and you're going to be in where? What's that small town? I'm in a little place called New York City. Yeah, yeah. um, So we can't be together as much. That's correct. So we are... I'm uh, sad about that. And I can see you are. I am, man. Hey, this has been fun. It's been a learning experience. It's been fun. Very, very thankful uh, that we were able, just a couple dudes from Oklahoma to pull this thing together and and have success with it and everybody that tuned in and listened. Well, we're really good at the cocktails part. That's what really that won't this change. Show to well. Speaking of that, yep, we're going to drink a cocktail. But first, we're going to talk about we've got a super guest today. So we did comic or not Comic Con, Crime Con, Crime Con, and uh, we were kind of introduced to the crime genre there. And we didn't have the pleasure of meeting our guest, but we had the pleasure of meeting about oh, I don't know, twenty thousand of his fans that were there. Just eagerly waiting for him. His just, only only fans? Yeah, it was kind of like only fans, but he was it was like he was the Beatles of Crime Con. Very much so. So we've got uh Paul Holes with us today, sir. Hey, how are you guys doing? Doing well, Paul. Thank you so much. So like I said, sorry to drop a little bomb on you and no pressure here. We're gonna see how you hold up. Uh yeah. honestly couldn't think of a better guest to have with our for our final one. So yeah. All the way from Quincy Smith being episode one uh, to Paul Holes for our final episode. Can't everything in between has been fantastic. So we're glad you're here. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm absolutely honored that you guys are having me as your last guest. I'm sad in that uh, you guys aren't continuing, you know, but uh, hopefully uh, we'll all stay in touch once all is said and done after this episode. Absolutely. Hey, uh, what's on his shelf back behind him besides a book that said Unmasked, My Life Solving America's Cold Case, Paul Holes? What's next to that? Well, that's the most important part, and that's that's some bourbon. I, I heard you guys talked about your little tour through through uh, Kentucky, you know, and I wonder how much of that bourbon you actually purchased versus just kind of took off with. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> well, if there was a good investigator out there, he could probably solve that crime pretty quick. We're, yeah, we're, we need to know what Kentucky's extra dick extra, <laughs> extra extradition dick. uh extradition <laughs> uh I've, extradition you said, what'd yeah. you call me I'm gonna extradite you you extradict uh, me yeah they're uh what they're what they're doing you know multi-states outside the states or whatever all right but can we drink some bourbon now we are so so paul we've got a old big boy here of uh weller, weller 12, 12 that we're sipping this on is... that's an old one too yeah, yeah, old style. They that's don't from, even make them that big anymore. So cheers. Welcome to our show, sir. And that's courtesy yep. of Jason Sales, who's not here with us. Mm. Mm. Okay, so right, I know a little bit of your background. I know that you share a couple of things in common with both of us. The one thing you share in common with me is that you were a military brat. Your dad was in the Air Force. So you that's moved correct. around. So you share that with me. And the other part is he well, landed up. My dad was in the military for 32 years, and my I'm mom not, was in sh- for 20, Howard. I'm, I, I'm, I bet they trump yours, but he shares that with me, too. Go ahead. I was going to get to you about the part that he uh, landed out in Vacaville. Okay. Are you from, Are you? were you at Travis Air Force Base? 
Yeah, my dad was stationed at Travis. I see there you uh, go. Mm-hmm. You know, went to high school at the high, you know, abandoned high school right outside of Travis, and I lifeguarded for I think what four years at the Travis Air Force Base pools. Well, I graduated from Fairfield High. Oh, jeez. Swear to God, yeah, I lived. Uh, actually, lived, our house was in Sassoon, but you know, of course, Travis Air Force Base is where the commissary was, and we went yeah. grocery shopping and all that stuff. Wow, what a small world! See, I told you. Yeah, I lived when we first moved out there in the eighth grade. I I went to uh, Sullivan Middle School in Fairfield, and I was living in a rental right across the street from Fairfield High. Wow. Man, no. So I lived. Okay, well, we're just going to keep going, and anyone do listening this. doesn't give a shit, probably. But uh, I lived on Treasure Island there in San Francisco uh, yeah. when it was, you know, the naval base. And in eighth grade, my parents didn't want me going to uh, uh, Vallejo High School in the city Vallejo. of San Francisco, so we moved out to Fairfield. I went to eighth grade at Grange oh. uh, Middle School. Yep, Grange, yeah. and then uh, then Fairfield High. So the Fairfield Falcons. Ah. Oh. Uh, I don't know that, but yeah. yeah I don't know. I just made it <laughs> up. But. I mean, what, dare I ask what year you graduated high school? Uh, 92. I graduated in 92. Oh, okay. So I was, I was 86. So I predate you. It doesn't look right. like we cross paths, but we yeah. were, you know, in the same place, uh, same mud, so to speak. Wow. What a, that's pretty, that's pretty awesome, honestly. Yeah. So, that's yeah. What I'm okay. All so right. with that said, he, go ahead and tell us your path into law enforcement. You didn't initially <laughs> get into it law enforcement through the normal channels or like I've always dreamed of being a police officer. No, not at all. Right? Yeah. You know, I, I ended up, you know, was, uh, when I was a kid, I became fascinated with this old TV show called Quincy. You know, mm-hmm. he was a forensic pathologist. Uh, little did I know that forensic pathologists, oh, they don't go to crime scenes. They don't investigate cases. You know, they're stuck in the morgue cutting up bodies, but I, didn't know that. So I thought, well, I want to become a forensic pathologist and had aspirations on going to medical school. Uh, ended up going to UC Davis, was pre-med with biochem degree and uh, kind of the, the, the girls uh, de- derailed my grades, so to speak. So med school was out of the question. Uh, but while at a job fair, I ran across uh, a, an old time criminalist at a booth and I'd never heard of criminalistics, but once I heard about how they used science to solve crimes, which was very much in line with what the TV show Quincy was doing, I was like, sold. And so that's what I ended up pursuing. And I was initially hired as a civilian forensic scientist and then promoted up to a criminalist position about three and a half years into my career, but my department was weird. We were the last department in the uh, in California that required the criminalist to go to the police academy. So I ended up going to the police academy and becoming a deputy sheriff criminalist. And I was assigned to the crime lab doing crime scene investigation. I was assigned to the serology unit doing ABO testing and enzyme testing and then ultimately DNA work. But I really gravitated towards the investigative side. And so as I worked cases and then ultimately promoted up through the ranks, I took advantage of having that sworn peace officer power and uh, decided, you know what, I'm going to do more than just, you know, suck fluid from one little tube to another doing DNA analysis, I'm going to go talk to people and try to solve cases. And and I gravitated towards the cold case side, as well as the serial predator side. And I spent, for the most part, uh, 24 years of my career working as a forensic scientist and as a cold case investigator. And then ultimately, you know, the last few years I was uh, with uh, Contra Costa County, I had transferred over to the, the district attorney's office as a bona fide cold case investigator. And, and that's uh, when I got the notoriety of, uh, you know, helping solve the Golden State Killer case. Wow. So uh, you need- little, and, and I know it sounds generic, but, you know, I was just a little, little criminal justice major, small state school. 
I'm familiar with UC Davis, you know. Actually, I saw Nirvana at UC Davis. Just oh, kind of throw you? that out there. I really oh, did. Wow. That's big. Yeah, okay. back in like 980, 90 maybe or something it like must, that. It must have been, was it at the Rec Hall at UC Davis? Yep. You know? Jesus. Yeah. Long I, time I know ago. exactly where that was at. Dude, that's a big flex. I yeah. didn't know that. No, that was that was just before they exploded, right when they were kind of just getting hitting, hitting huge. How was the show? It was amazing, man. So, yeah. So, was, did on, you ever wear a uniform? You know, I, well, when I was out in the field for the, the, the CSI work, I wore a hand-me-down jumpsuit. Uh, you know, <laughs> and of course, you know, I, I was badged up. I had the sidearm on. Um, and then after 9-11, I was now a lieutenant-level position, and the commander forced all of us on Wednesdays to wear a uniform throughout the day. So that was really the extent of my uniform wearing with the sheriff's office until I went over to the DA's office. And then it was polo shirt, BDUs. And when I was out in the field, you know, I had my sidearm on. Did you ever write a citation? No, no. I no. never wrote a <laughs> I never wrote nice. <laughs> you know, my, 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 my role was, you know, when it came to the investigative side was really compiling the, the physical evidence, going after the forensics talking to witnesses. And when I would get to a point where I thought I had something significant on the case and I'm pulling in resources. And then as a team, we would pursue what I had discovered. Well, we've probably had 40, probably 45 police officers on here, right? Sure. And I think this is the first police officer we probably have had that hasn't wrote a citation of some sort. <laughs> This is the first and a last for us. <laughs> it was more of a formality, I'm sure, just the, the deputization uh, type of deal. Well, Paul, let's talk about – sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, in, in some ways it was. Uh, but then, yeah. as, as I said, as I progressed through my career, it turned out to be very advantageous because then Absolutely. ultimately yeah. – you know, I closed my career out as an FBI task force officer. You know, yep. So not only am I getting that training, I had – federal level powers and resources to apply to cases. It was awesome. Hey, I, and I also know that means you have a certain amount of overtime allotted to you as a, uh, a cross deputized agent. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, just so you don't know, in case you don't know that Howard, whether you work a task force with you're a regular cop and you work with ATF or DEA or FBI, there is a certain amount that the federal government's allowed to pay these officers overtime throughout the year. So it's a, it's a nice bump when you're, if you know, if you're in the, it's kind of like a I mean, you're going to work, you earn it. I mean, you're out there working, don't get me wrong, but it's just a, I don't know. It's a reward. Essentially you're going to put in the hours and you're going to be able to get this extra overtime. Okay. So Paul, let's talk about obviously the golden state killer, as you mentioned, is kind of the one that, you know, everybody knows about uh, a couple other d cases. I would love to hear about some other guys that are sitting on death row that you were involved with um as well because i'm a firm sure. believer in people that commit heinous crimes should get that justice i know california system it might not happen but at least they're sitting where they need to where they need to be yeah. um kind of i'll let you just what you know break down the golden state killer situation you know when it started i think what 76 or something like that and how it led up to your involvement and ultimately his confession sure you know uh Initially, the case, as I knew it, when I first uh, ran across it in 1994, it was known as the East Area Rapist case. And this was a serial rapist that started uh, off uh, up in Sacramento in June of 1976, breaking into houses in the middle of the night, uh, tying up and, and sexually assaulting women. Uh, and eventually, after about 15 attacks, the, the East Area Rapist started to, to purposely break into houses when there was a man present, when there was couples asleep in their bed. And in those situations, you know, he is going into the couple's bedroom. He's standing at the foot of the bed or in the doorway. He's waking them up. And as soon as they wake up, he's shining a flashlight in their eyes so they can't see a thing. And then through, uh, you know, clenched teeth, He's basically hissing at them, do what I say or I will kill you. I have a 357 or a 44 Magnum. I will spatter your brains across the wall if you don't do what I say. And he'd put the gun in the beam of the flashlight so the couple could see that he did really have a gun. Then he would tie, uh, he would throw bindings to the woman 
and force her to tie her husband or boyfriend up face down on the bed. And then once the man was secure, he would go and tie up the woman. Then he'd go through the house and then come back with typically dishes or other types of trinkets that he would stack on the back of the man and then would tell the man, if I hear these, she's dead or I'll kill everybody in the house if there are kids in the house. And then he would take the woman out to the family room where he would sexually assault the woman. Um, and this was a pretty standard MO. There was some deviance, but you know, for the rest of his series up until uh, basically mid-1979, after 50 attacks in Northern California, he just wow. disappeared. Well, it turns out in October of 79, he goes down to Santa Barbara, which is Southern California, just north of Los Angeles. And in this case, it's a standard East Area Rapist attack up, up in North, but they don't know. You know they, they don't never heard of the East Area Rapist. They don't know his M.O., but in, once he separates the woman up out in that case in Santa Barbara, she hears him pacing back and forth. I'm going to kill him this time. I'm going to kill him. She freaks out. He loses control of, of that particular case and escapes. Two months later, he commits his first double homicide. Well, I shouldn't say his first double homicide, but he commits a double homicide in Santa Barbara. And then from that point on, all the cases that we know of, attributed to the Golden State Killer down in, in Southern California were homicide cases. He ended up killing, you know, starting in 1979, he killed 10 people across six cases down there. So, so did he, once he got down to Santa Barbara and this other incident, did every case going forward that he was involved with, he killed? Or is that just, at that was kind of the breaking point after the 50 up north, he then started sometimes killing people. No, he, from what we know, all the cases that we know of attributed to him from that point on in Southern California were homicides. There was no, no cases that we're aware, aware of where he left the victims alive after that first Santa Barbara case where it just went sideways on him. So when he went from north to south, was he relocating there? Was Did he move there? Or was this a just criminal tourism, I think is what it, they refer to it as? What was... Did he just want a new hunting ground? What was the, what was that about? Well, you know, before the case was solved, we didn't know. And, and the assumption was is that the offender was moving around the state and committing crimes where he was living. Uh, when I was evaluating the geographic profile up in Northern California, and the, the last phase that he had up in Northern California was my jurisdiction, the East Bay, San Francisco Bay Area, uh, and the original investigators assumed that he had moved there. But when I took a look at the profile, he did not show the broad familiarity of the region like he was showing up in Sacramento. And so I formed the opinion Oh, he never moved out of Sacramento. He's literally just traveling around Northern California. And then with Southern California, my thought was, is it's possible he's still just traveling around the state and his home base continued to be out of Sacramento. I will tell you now that we've identified the Golden State Killer as Joseph D'Angelo. We still don't know entirely why he's in certain locations at certain times. He did move down to Southern California for a period of time, but not the entire time, you know, for all the homicides, he wasn't down there the entire time. He was traveling back and forth for some of those cases. So he truly was uh, very mobile when it came to, you know, what his home base was, what his strong anchor point was versus where he was committing these attacks. And for D'Angelo, uh, you said you got involved looking at stuff in 1994. Start, these cases started in 1976 with the rapes. And how long did they go on? Were they still going on into the 90s when you, when you got into looking at these? Or they had just kind of – they had stopped sometime in the 80s, right? Yeah, well, you know, the, the series as I knew it when I first started, the East Area Rapist series, had actually ended in 1979. He disappeared off the face of the earth. Uh, what part of what I thought was going to be my claim to fame on the case is in 2001, 
using DNA and, and a telephonic level investigation, I was able to show that the East Area Rapist was this guy who was down south killing people who they knew as the original Night Stalker. The last known case down there, which was in Irvine, in Orange County, just south of Los Angeles, and that was May 5th, 1986, where he bludgeoned little 19-year-old Janelle Cruz to death in her bed. We have no known cases after 1986 attributed to, to D'Angelo. But then along comes a new criminal forensics guy that's a little curious and finds a file cabinet in the back and starts yeah. digging through files, right? So I assume this guy, start, he started his crime spree, stopped his crime spree, and then thought, okay, I'm good. So how did you put all these pieces together other than using the telephone and the new technology of DNA? Well, you know, it was, it was uh, quite the evolution in terms of as I worked the case over years, you know, trying to get a better understanding of who this offender was you know early on the original investigators and i uh, you know felt that well he's probably a a young younger man the late teens to mid 20s uh you know this you know kind of this roving poor drug addicted sex deviant that's just kind of traveling across the countryside in part based on what the living victims said to the you know the investigators back in the 1970s he would come in and say i'm here for food and money where are your drugs he would sometimes pretend to shake like he had withdrawal symptoms you know, so there's, there was a, an element of what I call verbal or behavioral staging in which the offender was trying to portray himself as something he was not. You know, it turns out while he's pretend, pretending to be this drug addict, he was a full-time law enforcement officer. You know, so he's, no shit. He, he's trying, yeah, he's trying to, he's trying to throw off the investigators. He had law enforcement training. He had investigative training when it related to burglaries. Um, so he was a more sophisticated offender. And when I really zeroed in on one guy, a railroad worker, I spent two years looking for this guy because he dropped off the face of the earth. And finally, we found him and I eliminated him with DNA. It was, I, I was devastated. I thought, how could I be wrong? I was sure it was him. And that's when I realized, oh, you know, I made him fit the evidence versus having the evidence guide me. And that's when I rejiggered my thought process. And then I started evaluating and reevaluating the information in the case files. And that's when I started to see, oh, this is a much more intelligent and sophisticated offender than what I gave him credit for at the beginning. Uh, and that gave me much better insight in terms of how I should proceed. And, and, and quite frankly, there's a piece of evidence, this hand-drawn diagram that I had numerous experts tell me, it looks like a developer trying to figure out how to, you know, do a master plan lake centric community. And I thought, okay, this guy's in the real estate development, you know, uh, contractor type world and focused in on that. But I was investigating some people who were, were worth millions of dollars, and I was making some pretty good circumstantial cases against these guys, only to eliminate them with DNA. And then fundamentally, DNA was what turned out to solve the case, and, and it was just due to the new technology when it came to the genetic genealogy. All right, well, well and Paul, we'll get to that about how that kind of all came together, but just talk about when you went back you know, originally thinking this was possibly a drug addict, a poor guy, and then, yeah. you know, you, you ultimately learned it wasn't. One of the things I read about that you did is you actually even went out, uh, I don't know if it was to every house, but you went out to numerous homes, you know, we're talking years and years later after these crimes were committed up there, to basically look at the houses, look at the neighborhood, to kind of get an idea of why these particular homes, these victims were chosen, and from my understanding, again, going back to what I read, is you were just talking about you formulator. You're like, hey, this guy, he, he's going to blend in in here. He's not going to be somebody that doesn't look like they, they don't belong here, that someone's going to you know, call the police because, hey, there's a homeless looking guy hanging out in our neighborhood. No, well, that's actually spot on. I went to every single crime, known crime scene location from the East Area Rape, from the 1976 East Area Rapist phase through the original Night Stalker phase, 
And that was so enlightening because he's not attacking in poor areas. You know, the, the, the areas that I would say would be the most yeah, kind of common areas were, were solid middle class areas. You know, the, the houses were nice, yards well kept, you know, decent cars and the driveways are on the street. Um, and then some of the areas where he's attacking uh, were, I would say, mid-upper to even upper-class neighborhoods, most notably down in Laguna Niguel in Orange County, the southernmost attack, which was a gated, you know, secure neighborhood, right, you know, a few blocks away from the beach. Houses were worth a ton of money, and they, there's roving security guards or security guards at the gate. And I was like, how is this guy getting in here if he's just driving a beater car and looking like some, you know, homeless zombie walking around, they would be calling the cops right away. And that told me, you know, this guy, he blends in. Yeah, you know, so that was part of, you know, as I evolved and looked at the case, that contributed to my understanding of him, uh, where now I'm, I'm elevating him up to somebody where, okay, he's, He's not somebody who stands out as a, a vagabond. He's somebody that can blend into these nicer communities. Okay, so this came as a shock to me. And I, I like to do some research, but what I really like to do is I like to hear the story about this. So you were using, you had a lot of people that you were trying to fit. Like, okay, I got a square peg. I'm trying to put it in this round hole. I'm doing this. This goes on for years. And this is a case that, I mean, stopped to the 80s and you're still working on it in the early 2000s, right? Yeah. And then you you, you meet a, uh, a wonderful uh, investigative reporter and she kind of sparks your interest. And just like I think everybody in the world right now, we're kind of a little reluctant to talk to the media because yeah. we don't know what their motives are. Uh, can you kind of share that with us? Sure. You know, um at a task force meeting, law enforcement task force meeting for this case, uh, Larry Poole from Orange County Sheriff's Office had been in contact with Michelle McNamara, who was a true crime blogger, and she was going to write an article about this case that she recently learned about and became fascinated with, which was our case, East Area Rapist case. And he had asked the task force members, hey, is it okay? Do we Should we cooperate with her? And we you know, did a round table and we all agreed it's time that this case got some better public attention due to, I mean, we're not solving it. We, we need to at least try to involve the public and let them know we're, we're still working the case and, and uh, we could use some help. So, you know, a few weeks after that meeting, Michelle called me up out of the blue. You know, I was, you know, driving in my you know, unmarked Ford Taurus, I pull into a parking lot and I'm just, you know, sort of in that Joe Friday mode, right? I don't want to, you know, she's a, she's a media person. I don't want to, you know, play my cards too openly. Um, but I also, because task force, we all agreed to cooperate. I wanted to at least be able to, you know, provide her with some information. But when I would give her very clipped answers to her questions, she would call me on. She would go, ah, oh, hold on. And she had knowledge about the case. And I was like, okay, you're right. You know, yeah, I, let me, let me kind of explain a little bit, you know, where, where I'm coming from. You know, from that point on, we kind of stayed in communication as she was writing this article for Los Angeles Magazine and developed a little bit of a bond where at some point I could see she was really going down a road with, with the slant she was taking on the article, I was like, well, that's not going to be entirely accurate. And I was debating, well, should I at least fill her in in terms of how I'm proceeding with my investigation and some of the sensitive aspects I was dealing with? And finally, you know, I decided, well, I'm going to I'm going to take a shot. And so I confided in her um, and I let her know this is what I'm doing. This is who I'm looking at. This is the reason why I'm pursuing this particular route. And I didn't know how that was going to play out. My big fear when that article came out was she was going to burn me. And then, you know, minimally the task force members would ostracize me because I was too open. Um, and then of course I was concerned about what my own department would do to me for possibly compromising an investigation with a public uh, civilian 
uh, journalist. Her article came out. I read the article, was like scared as to what I was going to see. And I saw that she didn't burn me. Uh, and that's when I was like, okay, this is somebody I could trust. Um, and then eventually, a few months after that, she had been asked to write a book about the case and she called me up and i offered hey why don't you come up and i will show you some of the crime scene locations up here and that's what she did and so we spent 12 hours together driving around or sitting in my office uh, she's recording the conversations but we got to know each other and it wasn't just about the case but we got into you know personal stuff and and we really developed we bonded we just hit it off um, and then from that point on, I was wide open with her. You know, this is what I'm doing. This is who I'm pursuing. Uh, she and her researcher, this Paul Haynes, had some skill sets in the public arena in terms of uh, getting data that uh, would blow me away in terms of what they could find. And of course, they're kind of looking at the case and they're hitting me up. And so if they had somebody, they said, hey, we ran across this name. I'd go, okay, let me take a look at this person and go up. Oh, I can eliminate this person. They're in custody for some of the cases, you know, doing this kind of back and forth assistance. Um, and, and the reality is, is over the course of the next three years, Michelle and I became investigative partners. You know, we just didn't ride in the car together, but we worked the case together and we had the highs and lows. You know, we both at, at different times thought we had solved the case and then DNA would come back and we both found ourselves crushed knowing that, oh, the person we were sure was the Golden State Killer was not the case. And it was a unusual, you know, public-private type of partnership for an investigation. But on a 44-year-old case, you know, at, at some point you go, okay, we need, uh, I need, you know, assistance. I did not have a, a partner in the case. I had a task force, you know, but we just kind of helped each other sporadically. We were spread across the state. Michelle and I were, were very much every night just communicating, whether it be on the case, what we're trying to do, how we could help each other, or just commiserating with each other with whatever was going on in our, our personal lives. Now that, and that is such a rarity to have somebody, you know, working a case, whether it's a, a cold case or obviously something, you know, that's just recently happened and literally have a partnership, not just as someone in the civilian world, but somebody that's in the media world. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that is a very, very unique deal. So kudos to you, though, for, uh, I guess, not having the ego or, you know, whatever it is to think, no, this is mine. I've got this. I'm going to, you know, keep it to myself because you and I both know there's a lot of people in this profession uh, and they, they, they hold everything into themselves and, and live or die by whatever they find. Yeah, you know, and, and, and it's 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 ego, but also, you know, like with the media side, I, I've been burned by the media. You know, sure. I, I've, had, I've been interviewed and I've, I've seen how they twist, you know, they, you know, take us uh, an answer out of context, you know, and I was like, no, that's not that's not what I was talking about. But with Michelle, you know, I it was just one of those. You know, fortunate, her, her personality, you know, really, and, and, and the trust she built with me, we just clicked. And, and she, quite frankly, she, you know, developed, you know, bonds with other investigators on the task force. She just had a very, um, she was very smart, but she also just had a really easygoing personality that was likable. And, and she took advantage of that, but she didn't take advantage of that. Well, hey, well, Paul, listen, we've got about 15 minutes and we still have been wrapped up. Uh, We're going to talk State to you about our here, partner. But, but uh, we've got a little partner ourselves. So you started, uh, or I'm sorry, these, this case started back in the 1970s, as we talked about. And back in the 1970s, uh, body grooming was, was a little bit different than it is these days. And uh, <laughs> that's why we are happy to partner up with Manscaped because we are, we are modern gentlemen here. Modern and uh, in some ways, I guess, but we are happy to partner up with Manscaped. It is that time of the year, it's hot as hell here in Oklahoma. It's 104. I've got the, the, the hair cut down right now, Howard's kind of cut down as well. You got to stay groomed on the other parts of your body, though, right? Absolutely, Howard? man. And the thing that's most important about that is not only do you have to stay groomed, but it's got to be safe. It does, it has and to be safe, and that's why the Manscaped 4.0, you like this, Paul? Yeah, the Manscaped. 
4.0. If you don't know this, but if, I mean, if you don't own this, shame on you, first of all. I know right. you're living in Colorado now, kind of a hippie area out there. Yeah, you need you one of these. You still need one of these things out there, man. The Manscaped 4.0, if you go to Manscaped and use Sticks 20, S T I C K S 20 for 20% off. Hey, and don't forget the ball deodorizer. The ball deodorizer is. Yeah, I didn't a, even uh, know. This was a hygiene thing that I didn't even know about until yes. uh, Manscaped introduced it into our lives. And it's like deodorant for your scrotum. Yeah. Would recommend five stars. Yeah. Top yeah. Five. And, and I just want to go on record and say my personal hygiene is on point. Atta boy. <laughs> well, of course it is. Thank you. Absolutely. As it should be. So I know you've got someone else from your, your, your side that is listening in right now. And I'm glad that uh, they are muted. Let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so, uh, so D'Angelo, as you mentioned, you know, uh, he was in law enforcement, was a police officer. What agency did he work for? Uh, I'm going to make this multiple question. What, and I, I don't know the answer to that because I did not look that up. But what agency did he work for? How long was he in? Do we have okay. any idea why he stopped committing crimes in the 80s that he did? And how did you catch his ass? Well, you know, considering I think you mentioned earlier, you're a criminal justice major. Once upon a time back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. prior to law enforcement. Yes, yes, I was. So easy, so easy to gr- e- very easy degree, by the way, if anybody's listening, you want an easy four year degree. Criminal justice is pretty easy, but go fire ahead. Fire safety. Yes. Yeah. So, but D'Angelo graduated Sacramento State with a criminal justice degree. Uh-huh. He uh, worked as a Roseville PD intern. He was hired by Exeter PD, which is down in South Central California, right next to Visalia. And that becomes important in this case. And, and goes to the police academy at the College of the Sequoias in Visalia, graduates, and then is working as an Exeter PD cop. At the same time he's down there, this is when we have a whole bunch of fetish burglaries going on in the neighboring town Visalia by an offender known as the Visalia Ransacker. And at one point, when this Visalia Ransacker tries to abduct a 16-year-old girl out of her house and dad tries to come to the rescue, he shoots and kills the dad, Claude Snelly. No shit. Well, this is D'Angelo. He is an Exeter PD cop at the time these crimes are occurring. He ultimately is promoted at, to a sergeant with Exeter. He is part of the burglary, the anti-burglary task force is sent on the public dime to go to burglary school where he learns how to investigate burglaries and how burglars commit crimes. And then after he gets and shoots, is confronted by an officer when he's got, you know, he's, he's uh, you know, prowling out in Visalia, uh, D'Angelo ends up uh, moving up north of Sacramento and becomes an Auburn PD cop. He ends. He gets the hell out of Dodge, and uh, ends up becoming a patrol officer with Auburn PD. And that's at the time that in June of '76, where we start getting the East Area rapist attacks. And D'Angelo, as a full-time Auburn police officer, commits 50 sexual assaults or attempted sexual assaults all over Northern California for the next three years. And the only reason he doesn't stay in law enforcement is he gets arrested up in the Sacramento area, Citrus Heights. He's trying to shoplift dog repellent and a hammer out of a convenience store. And now he's an arrested officer. The Auburn PD chief, Nick Willick, puts him on admin leave. And when they go and and search his house, they find all sorts of stolen commercial property, like commercial power tools still in the boxes. So he's, he's you know, committing commercial burglaries in addition to all these East Area rapist attacks. But ultimately, he is terminated as an officer. And it's right then when he's terminated as an officer is when he goes down south and starts killing. So you look at him, the profile, his entire adult life was being in law enforcement. He wanted that authority. He wanted that power and control over people, yet he's committing these horrendous acts. And when he loses that law enforcement aspect, he escalates to homicide. That stressor was too much. He, he, he could not stand losing that authority over other people that, that, that the badge allowed. 
And, and I believe he continued working as a security guard, uh, though I don't have any actual proof. I have some circumstantial evidence and some witness statements from family members. What, what, speaking of family members, was he married at all? Yeah, you know, he was, uh, he got married in 1973. Um, and, uh, they were married during the entirety of the East Area Rapist phase, as well as the original Night Stalker series. So the information I've got is that they lived separately at, at different points in their life. Um, and the interesting aspect is in 1981, uh, he goes in and commits a double homicide in Santa Barbara of, of Gregory Sanchez and Sherry Domingo. And then he doesn't attack again for five years. Well, it turns out that in that 1981 case, his wife was seven months pregnant with his first daughter. Five years go by. That's when he commits his last attack on Janelle Cruz in 1986. And that is when his wife is seven months pregnant with his second daughter. So now after his last known case, he's got two very young girls in the house. And then he ultimately has a, a third daughter and he has no more attacks after this family gets started. Now, I, I can't say that's why he stopped. I mean, he was older in 1986, he's 41 years old, you know, and, and he, the type of crimes he was committing were, were very physically demanding, jumping fences and breaking into houses in the middle of the night. And I believe that he probably realized that his physical skill sets physical capabilities were diminishing. Um, well, he's clearly but, not built like the three of us. Now. That's right. That's right. That's, I mean, come on now. We're not young, but we can still hop a fence. Heck yeah. I, I might be able to get over it, but I would That's hurt. It. Afterwards. <laughs> well, let me ask you, what's the correlation in solving this crime between the Church of Latter-day Saints and genealogy? This is some interesting science as well, correct? Yeah, you know, well, the, uh, yeah, I, I have been pursuing the genealogy side from DNA because, you know, when I eliminated my railroad guy, I was like, well, what evidence do I have that I think will point me in the right direction? Well, I had this hand-drawn map. Well, that was a big fail, at, at least at this point in time, but also the DNA. And we had exhausted everything about the DNA from a technology standpoint. It had been up in CODIS. We had searched Interpol, you know, other countries' databases. Uh, we had done everything we possibly could with no luck. And then it was like, well, let's look at genealogy. Let's see if we can find his relatives. And I started back at that back in 2012, talking with a genetic genealogist by the name of Colleen Fitzpatrick, who is still very active and successful to this day. Um, but that didn't that older genealogy technique didn't work out. And then I was involved in another case in which a different newer version of the genealogy tool was utilized that helped identify a little girl as an abducted girl out of new, out of new hampshire and i was like how did that work and that's when i reached out to another genealogist who had done the work uh, barbara ray venter and uh asked her could this tool genealogy tool be used to solve you know identify an unknown offender if we had his dna because the Golden State Killer left his semen all over California. You know, he, he, he wore a mask. He always had gloves on. But, you know, his semen was everywhere. And so we had his DNA. And Barbara's response was, well, I see no reason why it wouldn't work. But then she kind of disappeared. Uh, she wasn't communicating. And I thought, oh, here's a genealogist that doesn't work with law enforcement. But fortunately, I had an FBI guy who was, he was an attorney with the FBI Steve Kramer called me out of the blue and say, hey, I hear what you're doing with genealogy because I had given an update to the task force. And he said, how can I help? And then at that point, Kramer and I, we did a deep dive ourselves in terms of trying to figure out how this genealogy tool would work and then how we could get DNA from the Southern California agencies that still had Golden State Killer DNA and search the databases. And that's what we ended up doing. And then Barbara came back six, seven months later saying, hey, do you still need, need my help? <laughs> yes, yeah. absolutely. And at this point, we had formed a very small team. And due to some politics, which I 
discuss in the book out of Orange County, we had gone covert with the fear that we would be shut down. Uh, and so I had a small team and we worked this uh, and then ultimately landed on D'Angelo. And I know I was skeptical. I was looking at D'Angelo's background going, how could a full-time Auburn PD officer commit all the crimes he was doing across all Northern California. I was like, there's just no way, you know, that he wouldn't have the time, but decided I better dig into him. Well, listen, uh, Paul, we've only got, I don't know, three minutes or so left. And obviously you've got the book up there behind you, Unmasked, Unmasked, mm -hmm. uh, My Life Solving America's cold looks like was it cold, cold cases, cases. Cold That's, cases. It's, it's, the lights on it like trying, trying to read it from here <laughs> uh but tell us you know tell us about the book obviously you go into further detail not only about d'angelo but i assume some other cases yeah. um and uh, you know some of the guys that we're just not going to have time because i know you're very good at this and you do fill uh, audiences that want to come listen to you speak at some of the places you do talk about this stuff but uh daryl kemp joseph um was it Cordova. Yeah, so, you got yeah. Nato, Joe Nato, Joseph Cordova Jr. Nice. Um, yeah, yeah, there's other, you know, there's other serial predators that I had, you know, some involvement with helping get caught and or, you know, sentenced to death out in California. You know, my book Unmasked uh, really, you know, started out as it was going to be a deep dive on the investigation of the Golden State Killer case. And, you know, it still does have information on the investigation that has never been made public before. But it evolved because when I got my collaborator, Robin Gabby Fisher, who helped write the book, uh, and she's getting to know me, and I'm talking about all these other cases I've been involved with, such as Lacey Peterson and J.C. Dugard. She was like, oh, my God, you know, here's the story. But as we wrote that, and now working with the publisher, the publisher was going, we need to know more about Paul. And, you know, part of what I was experiencing and, and reflecting upon my career to Robin is the emotional outpouring. You know, there's times when I'd be talking to Robin and I'm just breaking down. I'm crying as I'm talking to her. And that's when it, it became apparent. I, my book opens up with a psychological break that I had after I retired, not knowing what was happening to me. And when I went in to see a therapist and was de detailing the types of cases that I was working, going out to, and she's going, all of these cases are a form of trauma. And I just suppressed them. And now I'm in my 50s, the, you know, the, the, the career from that side is behind me. But all those cases were like a little nick. And, you know, one nick by itself isn't going to cause you much harm. But when you have hundreds of nicks, you start bleeding out. And so my book, you know, it really turned into, of course, you've got the, the, you know, the Golden State Killer and these other cases and the stories and details, but it also turned into the my memoir about how working this career and these types of cases has an impact and had an impact on me and has had an impact on the other professionals that people don't recognize. People understand when an officer gets involved in a shooting, that's a traumatic event for that officer. But if you're a homicide investigator responding to a homicide of a young kid, if you're a death investigator, if you're a CSI that's spending hours looking at family photos while there's a family member dead in front of you, this is not normal stuff. And I know you guys can relate to this. And so that really became an important message about my book. And, you know, I was validated. I had a, a law enforcement buddy. Uh, he's on another podcast, Small Town Dicks. This Dave Grice, who spent 10 years as a child abuse investigator. Shit. He read my prologue and he texted me saying, that hit me hard. I so relate. And that was my validation. That was like, okay. You know, it's not just me experiencing this. There are many people that have, you know, lived the life, whether it be in law enforcement, whether it be in the medical side, that are experiencing things that the average person never sees. And you don't recognize that it's necessarily trauma, but it's affecting your relationships. It's a, it's affecting, I mean, you, you know, <laughs> the bourbon is definitely a, a form of self-medication. And so it really became a fundamental message to get out there. And so that's yep. really, my Unmasked became a much bigger 
all-encompassing aspect about my career than what I initially thought it was going to be. No, and Paul, you're, you know, just kind of in closing, uh, I mean, you're spot on there. Obviously, you know, Howard, you know, being in nursing and going back to the COVID stuff, you see stuff that people shouldn't ever see. You know, those of us in law enforcement, especially if you're working for a larger agency that has a lot of violent crime and, you know, yep. child type cases, rapes, things of that nature. Um, I, I did a, a speech uh, last fall back out in October um, and it, it was in Baltimore. And one of the things I actually spoke about was the impact that this career has on you. And there's a study out there that shows that a male in the civilian world compared to a male in law enforcement, their life expectancy life expectancy is 22 years more than somebody yeah. in this profession. And that's why it is. It, it's, it's all of those things over a 20, 25, 30, 35 career, 35 year career that, that build up on you on the inside. And, you know, I came on in 97, uh, into law enforcement. You were obviously in there before me, even just in my, you know, the 20, nearly 25 years I was on, it has changed a lot. It used to be, you know, you didn't talk about it. You're tough and all this type of stuff. Now agencies, obviously a lot of them have psychological services. Um, you know, it's encouraged by peers. It's encouraged by supervisors to go out there and, and, you know, talk to people, get help, stuff like that. So that you're not, um, you know, internally just beating yourself up over it. Yeah, but as all of us, all three of us here can really attest to, you, you, you can't be tough through this. You can't man through this stuff. You can't just bow up and take it and go. This is, you got to get some help. And people, it's real good to hear you say that you got some help. Yeah. Definitely coming back from COVID assignments and after shoveling bodies, you, you know, I had to get help. If, if you're in that situation, go talk to somebody. Plenty of services out there that can get you uh, – a different mental perspective that's much needed. Don't turn to the bottle. Don't turn to being unhappy. Just go talk to somebody. All right, Paul, where can people uh, find you? Um, where can they find your book? Well, you know, my, my book is available all over the place. Uh, you know, uh, Amazon. Uh, I'm, see, I'm seeing it in airports. It's so weird to see there. But it's, <laughs> okay. the, the title Congrats. is, you know, my, my, uh, you know, my life solving America's cold cases. Uh, people can find me, you know, I, I have, uh, you know, Twitter and Instagram accounts, but I'm not a social media guy. I, you know, it, it, that really is more, you know, PR stuff and I'll post a little personal stuff. Um, but I'm excited about a, a new podcast I'm going to be involved with. Uh, it's going to, it's called Buried Bones. Uh, it's with Kate Winkler Dawson. It's about historic crimes. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, that's going to be coming out soon. Uh, very excited about that. And it will be available wherever, you know, you, you, you can get access to your podcast. Well, Paul, man, we cannot think of a better guest person, investigator to close out uh, the Cocktails and Cocktails to send podcast. To send us into the sunset. So, brother, we appreciate it, man. Thank Cheers. you for everything. All right. Cheers. I am so honored to, to be your last guest. And I Wish you guys the best moving forward and stay safe. All right. Now I know you're going to log on to Manscaped. Have a good one. Yeah. <laughs>